We're less inclined and slower to judge and to condemn when we have a decent idea of the culture of the people, the thinking of the people, and there's no better avenue, there's no better route to achieving this than through the books authored by people within that culture. Hello and welcome to Inspiring Open, candid conversations with influential women who have made an impact in Africa. We're talking about their personal, educational and career journeys, the choices they have made along the way and what they have gained by setting aside their doubts in a world where women's voices and opinions often go unheard and unacknowledged. Inspiring Open is a space to explore the value of sisterhood and how networks of sharing and openness can create waves of change. I am Betty Kankambwedu, a journalist and women's rights advocate. Join me as I explore the fascinating backstories behind Africa's most tenacious female personalities. Inspiring Open is a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women, a project of Wiki in Africa. Be inspired, be challenged, be bold. My guest today is Lola Shaneing. Lola didn't see writing as a special skill growing up. She thought everybody could write, and so she started to write. Fast forward, Lola is now an award-winning author and poet. Some of her works include three books of poems, three children books, and her highly acclaimed novel, The Secret Lives of Baba Segi's Wives, which was nominated for the Orange Prize for Fiction in 2011 and went on to win the Penn Awards. In 2020, it was announced that the book would be a Netflix production. She's also the founder of Book Buzz Foundation, organizers of the Arche Arts and Book Festival, one of the most important literary festivals on the African continent. Lola runs Wida Books, a publishing house and one of the most vibrant bookstores for eclectic readers in Nigeria. She is blind to obstacles and believes she can do anything she sets her mind to, and it's evident in her career trajectory. Let's dive straight into it with Lola. Can you tell us about your childhood and the kind of upbringing your parents gave you? I think um, as I've grown older, um, and, and as I've grown older and look back on my childhood, I think it was one of extreme um, happiness and joy, um, but also at times one of extreme pain and sadness and humiliation. Um, So I grew up in the kind of family where a raucous laughter is very, was very much a part of our lives. We laughed at one another. We laughed at our circumstances. We laughed sometimes um, at the people we loved. Um, We were a happy family. We joked around. Um, But also, um, there were difficult aspects of it. Um, And there were very traumatic aspects of it. Um, Because as children, we were also exposed to... Uh, a lot of individuals who pretended um, to help us simply because they had been invited into our lives by my mom, who who rejects the notion that things just happen. Everything happened for a reason, and a lot of the time she wanted to know that reason. Um, And this led to, like I said before, being exposed to people, I think, who um, took advantage of the family, um, took advantage of our innocence as children. So when I look back and when I think back at those times, I realized that it was a very mixed childhood. So although there is some uh, inherited trauma, there are also several memories of joy, of, um, of happiness, of contentment, of friendship, and of love. 
Um, so that's the best way I think that I would summarize my upbringing. Um, I had a few very difficult um, events that happened to me. I was um, sexually abused um, when I was three years old. Oh. I think it's uh, like it is for most people. It's something that you you carry around for the rest of your life, especially when you have reached the point when you know how to forgive yourself, uh, which sounds strange, but sometimes that is the most important element of being able to overcome the very negative emotions and the very self-destructive feelings that one gets to uh, that one gets over the years um, and the way that one punishes oneself for having been exposed to that at an age where um, it shouldn't have happened at all. Yeah, so grateful, extremely grateful that my life has been a life of words, has been a life of um, access to writing, to books, you know, to which gave me escapism when I was young. I learned to read very quickly and um, I learned and knew how to disappear into books. And I loved that. And luckily I went to a school where I had to read every afternoon for 45 minutes. It was mm. compulsory. I went to a school where um, if you did your work quickly and finished, your the teacher would read um, books to you, which totally made me fall in love with being read to. So till today, I enjoy being read to immensely. Uh, I seize every opportunity to read to children and to read to even adults because, I mean, there's just something so life-affirming um, about that process. Um, I'm very lucky that very early on I made the link between writer and book. Uh, a lot of people don't remember this about Prince Charles, but who came to visit um, the prep schools in Edinburgh at the time, but he wrote this book called The Old Man of Loch Nagar, and we all got a signed copy. Um, so I, I could, that connection between book, written word, and the person behind the words was very real to me. And I therefore thought it was normal, and it was something that most people did. So yes, that's, that's I guess, what I can say about my childhood. But for the abuse, it sounds like you had an incredible childhood. And I'm so sorry about the abuse. I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. And knowing that you experienced sexual abuse, my mind just took me to the rip scene in your book, The Secret Lives of Babatsegi's Wives. The scene was so vivid. It, it felt like the reader was experiencing it. Um, but it important to let you know that that wasn't my experience but it was the experience of a woman who is who has now died who was very mm. close to me she relayed it to me she told me exactly how it happened and I internalized it and then I wrote about it mm. and it was one of the ways that I wanted to honor her mm. um, and record it, record that event. I thought it was important for people to know that this sort of thing actually happens. So yeah. that's the story of that specific woman. Uh, yeah. mm, mm. What did you study in school? And did you know at that point, obviously from your love of books and how you, you, you practically grew up in a reading culture, did you know at that point that author was ever going to be in the cards for you in the future? No, I, I thought writing was ev something everyone did. I didn't think it was particularly special. Um, so I was always writing, always recording, always doing diary entries. And because I was somewhat melancholic, um, Writing, again, was just another means of escapism for me. I, even these days, I sometimes, I am not uncomfortable, but slightly, um, I feel slightly fraudulent 
when I describe myself as an author because I am writing, but um, but I'm also several other things. So I'm also a publisher. I'm also a bookstore owner. I also work in a bank, even though I'm not a banker. I also work with a, a fill in within the film industry. So I don't know if calling me a writer is is completely accurate. It's part of part of the many things that I do, and I feel very lucky to 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 have that privilege. So I studied literature in school to answer your question, and I absolutely loved university in Nigeria. I, 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 I loved the experience and I consider myself very lucky to have had lecturers like Wale Oyedili who really pushed me um, and who didn't let me get complacent about whatever gifts or capabilities that I had. They made me work, they encouraged me to work hard and I'm eternally grateful for that. So after school, what was the first job you took on? My first paying job was working with a, a literary journal called Glendora Review as their marketing officer. So the year before that same publication, I was the poet of the publication. So they published a picture of me along with some of my poems um, which was a huge thing for a young woman. Um, and then I also, so I started working for them and the job involved, uh, I used to go office to office, talk to everybody I know who enjoyed, you know, the literary world or literary endeavors or literary things and try to get them to subscribe so that this beautiful publication could go on living. Um, that was my first job. Um, before that, I have to say that I had already, from 1994, 90, from 1994, 95, I was already getting friendly with um, the members of the Association of Nigerian Authors. We had a branch in Ibadan, which is where I grew up. And I used to rub shoulders with people like uh, Miss Mabel Shigun, who is over 90 now, um, Professor Femi Oshofison, Professor Niyo Shundari, Odia Ofemo, Harry Garuba, Ogaga Ifowodo, Obinwa Kama, Payo Sade Somi, um, Remy Raji. There's a long list of, right, of poets and writers that I would meet up with at the monthly events and that I learned so much from. I mean, just being in their midst just made such a big difference to giving me the confidence that I needed um, at that age, but also learning from them. Uh, many of them would pull me aside and say, oh, that poem, why don't you try this? Why don't you do this? You know, things like that. So um, that was my life at that time. And that's how I became confident enough by the time I was so that such that by the time I was 23 years old, I entered my poem book of poems unpublished was shortlisted for an association of Na Nigerian authors national prize. I think the two other shortlisted authors, Remy Raji and Unchi Unduka, I think they were maybe couldn't be less than maybe 15 years older than me. I was just 22, 23 at the time. And I had these much older men and I didn't win the prize, but it was wonderful. It was um, a real boost. Um, it was uh, a, real, um, a real confidence booster for a young girl and it made me even more fearless. But more than that, it, it helped me realize that I could do it. And I just never looked back. I also by then had founded my own publishing house. I, I was inspired by the women's press um, in the US at the time. You may not know it, but it was a, they published these books where their logo was an iron, you know, 
with a little cord. It was very interesting to me. And I, I thought, this is amazing. If these people, the women's press, if I could just publish women, you know, nobody's ever done that. And I think that means we could, um, we could find ways to promote women's voices. So that was my thinking at the time. And I called it Oval Onion. That was the name of the publishing house because an oval onion kind of looks like a womb. Um, yeah, well, <laughs> that was that. Interesting. Obviously, you said that growing up, you didn't think that writing was such a big deal and that you thought everybody wrote because you would write all the time. But I reckon at some point, something must have clicked or you realized that you could go commercial with your writing. I've never, that has strictly never really crossed my mind. A lot of the things that I do in my life are just because I know that I can do them. And I'm just waiting for the rest of the world to catch up with that knowledge that it can be done. Um, so I dare myself a lot. I often say that I have obstacle blindness. A lot of the things that seem to stop other people from achieving their goals or going for the things they want, I don't see those things. I, if they, I mean, when they're there, I strictly see them as things to work through. They are not to be an encumbrance. They are not to be an obstacle. If I can't get through it, I will get over it, but I will get to my goal. And that's always been my mindset. So when I wanted to write Baba Segi, it was be that was my third attempt at writing a novel. You know, I'd written um, Fertility Nails. I'd written Harlot. Um, I couldn't find a publisher. You know, there was this story and I wrote it and I knew I could write it. So I don't know. It wasn't so much, ooh, I've got to write the, a novel. It was more, um, this is something I know I can do and I, I'm going to do it. The time, the time feels right for me. It, it didn't even feel like after that novel, I didn't even really feel the pressure of a second novel because I just don't put my, I, it, I put myself under pressure. And it's one thing I've learned um, as I've got older. I just reject pressure put on me by other in the external in, um, pressure because I don't cope well with it. I mean, the two books that you wrote that were not published, are you ever going to publish them? I don't know. I doubt it. I, I wonder how yeah. that must have felt. You know, you wrote two novels, hoping to get them published, and a publisher says no, and then, like the the, oh, no. the stories just, you know, go into not quite, not quite like that. The first one, fertility nails, I would describe as juvenilia. It's as, you know, it's just early writing that deserves to go into the bin. Harlot, my agent loved. My agent thought we could sell it for sure. And boy, did she try. She took that novel everywhere and everybody rejected it. When we couldn't find a publisher, my agent, Jessica Woolard, was very much on my side. Um, and desperately, like I was hoping to get a publisher and we couldn't get one. And then she was like, you know what? I've tried everything. Let's start again. Is there anything else? What do you think? Blah. You know, I, th I know you've got talent. I know you can do this. You've just got to hit the right note. And she said, is there any other idea that you have for a novel? And I said, well, there's an idea I have for a play, but not a novel. And she said, oh, forget plays. Plays don't sell. And then she said, anyway, tell me the story. And I told it to her. And she said, that's your next book. Now go and write it. And the rest is history. And what do you think made that difference? I mean, what was so special 
at that time? Because you, you said that Harlot was a fantastic um, book as well. But what was special yeah. about the secret lives of Baba Segi's wives that even your agents knew that it, it would sell at that point? I think it, it, it's an important story, a very important story for Africa. And I think Jessica could sense that. Um, the fact that that story needed to be written at all is just testament to um, how um, there are lots of people, especially especially on the African continent, who um, are still pondering over if there's such a thing as male infertility, for instance. Um, as you know, it's often always the woman's fault. That's what is generally believed. And I think this book, um, Baba Segi, pokes a bit of a hole in that. But beyond that, it also reinforces one of my beliefs, which is that it's not the sperm donor that's necessarily the father of a child. It's the person who nurtures, who protects, and who raises so which are just uh, little elements of, you know, my personal beliefs. But I think also perhaps because she realized that the book also addresses a few taboo topics, one being uh, homosexuality, another being uh, Christianity. You hear a lot of stuff about Islam and fundamentalist uh, thinking and perhaps not enough about the dangers of Christianity in the southwest, um, western parts of Nigeria. And of course, uh, conversations around depression and why people take the wrong decisions often when they're depressed. Yeah, and I mean, I, I found it very, very interesting because I thought there were a myriad of serious themes mm. that were brought That's to bear true. in the book in a very humorous way as well one thing that also um drew my attention and you just mentioned was the part about homosexuality Ia Segi and I think the tomato seller yes and how she fantasized about the tomato seller and how she's mm-hmm. making all this money and wanting to um mm-hmm. splurge it on the tomato seller and I, mm-hmm. I I I found that to be daring even though you did not really explore that story that much but I thought mm-hmm. it was daring of you, you, particularly for the kind of people you write for, you say that you, you proudly say that your audience is, is African. You write for the African Absolutely. audience. Absolutely, I write for the African audience. Those are the people I see in my mind's eye as my potential readers. Um, that particular character, Iyasegi, and that particular story was important to me because. People were already saying bizarre things like homosexuality is a Western construct, homosexuality is an African homosexual. And I just thought, what, what, what is wrong with, why are you locking yourself into a corner um, and covering yourself with honey and inviting bees? Because that's what it sounds like when you come up with that kind of, or you try to push that kind of premise. Um, When everybody knows homosexuality and gender has to do with humanity, it's it's not, it's got nothing to do with, it's not particular or peculiar to a particular race or or peoples. So um, what I was doing there very specifically was, um, here's this woman who has never had any contacts with the West, never traveled abroad, never met a white person, yet has these impulses. So the point there being that it's from within as opposed to being um, a phenomenon that arises in response to an external um, influence. So that was the point of that. It wasn't really the homosexuality. It was more that question about you know the origin story that I wanted to address because once you've addressed that then the rest is easy to navigate 
And then also, obviously, the issue of polygamy. I know your stance on polygamy from watching your interviews and all that. Because when I looked at the characters, the women, I found out that none of them really wanted to go into that marriage in the first place. They found the marriage as an escape. In some way, I do agree with you on your stance on polygamy because in the first place, I'm sure a lot of these women who probably engage in it, it will probably not be a first option for them. Well, exactly. And that's... I've, I've moved a little on my stance, not on polygamy, but on women... Um, agreeing to join polygamous households. Um, the biggest thing for me with about feminism, the most important elements of feminism for me as an, as an individual and as an African woman is opportunity and um, choice. Um, it's the one thing that is in short supply for women. So you've got to ask yourself that as a woman, and bearing in mind that polygamy is most common in the rural areas where people are less skilled, where people are often less educated, where it's less likely for women to be financially independent and stuff like that. So if you bear all that in mind, you've got to ask yourself that should those wom women in polygamous homes should they have been given or had they been given certain opportunities to be educated, to delay marriage, to, you know, go and work and get a PhD, to go and apprentice and become a tailor, to go and try to learn how to fry plantain and cook it in the, and fry plantain in the marketplace and have a stall and have ownership of their own money. Had they had those opportunities, would they have taken those ones over getting into um, it be of, over being married? But also choice, you know, the fact is a lot of women don't have a choice in the matter. Um, that's not their first choice. I mean, I was talking to a lovely, lovely young lady um, on, on Saturday and she was telling me, she's 24 years old, and she was saying to me, you know, I don't even think I want to get married. And I don't know how to, to broach that conversation with my parents. And she's bright. She's an engineer, making a lot of money, working for a foreign company while be, whilst being here. And I thought, wow, how far have we come that a young woman is even able to voice that. In my time, even if I had that thought or if I was that way inclined or my thinking was going in that direction, I wouldn't even have probably had the courage to say it. Of course, my thinking wasn't like that. I was, um, I loved, I was in love with love um, and I was in love with babies. So I always knew I was going to have lots of children. I have four. I always knew that um, I enjoyed the, the high and the emotion and the security that I believe that love brings um, or that love brought to you. So that wasn't my mindset. But I'm just saying that even if it were, I wouldn't have been able to voice it so confidently. Yeah, my friend um, Nanama tells me a lot that she thinks that the whole institution of marriage should be demystified so that it should be okay if a woman says it is not for me. And even childbearing, if a woman says that this is not for me, um, it should be okay. And for women who want it, it should also be okay for them to want it that bad. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But that's what I'm saying about opportunity and choice. We should be, be in a position to make those choices. But the, the honest truth is that we're really not. We're still very heavily driven and dictated to by what society thinks it's, is appropriate or what society thinks it's, it's, is right. And Lola, I also love the way you 
unapologetically, you know, wrote about sex in, in your book. Mm. And <laughs> I listened to one of your interviews where you said you used fuck like 12 times and your husband drew your attention to it to yeah. reduce it. Yeah. But, you know, anytime you would describe the sex scenes, whether it is um, or Femi, you know, the, the sex scenes they were having, you would go into such details and you will you will kind of describe how the women were enjoying the sex well exactly that was the whole point the 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 i wanted to to show that that you could have it was possible to have bad sex and that it didn't have to be acceptable or accepted that was really the whole point so the sex with the different wives the pom and if you can tell a lot from the words that I use or the adjectives that I use to, or, you know, or the adverbs to describe the sort of sex that they're having. So from pummeling to pumping to pounding. And then in other circumstances, I would use a different set of words like caressing, like, uh, you know, throbbing, like, you know, different ones. And the whole idea is to, bring awareness to the fact that sex isn't just sex and that um, sex can be painful, sex can be damaging, sex can be traumatizing, sex can be pleasant, sex can be healing and sex can be joyful. Um, and, and it's important for even women um, to, to um, reject uh, bad sex if it's not giving them the sort of pleasure that it ought to. When two people are or are engaged in an act, it's very one-sided when one is only receiving and circumstances and tradition make it such that that person is unable to fully express themselves because they are expected to behave as receivers to behave in a certain way, such a person is not free. But of course, a lot of the time, men who see themselves as the givers and as the as the I mean as the individuals who as who provide the sexual pleasure, um, they can do it with as many people as they want, as many times as they want, as many women as they want, even legally within polygamy. So sex then becomes a metaphor for freedom. Um, how, how, the, in, in, and in a way, um, one can also say that the manner in which you engage with sex is almost synonymous with how much freedom you perceive yourself as having as an individual within these very conservative societies. Yeah, that's true. And Lola, when you set out to write this book, I mean, obviously you knew it was going to be successful, but did you anticipate this level of success that how many years later, you know, it, it it's what everybody still talks about as a book so many people still love, it's a book that people enjoy. This big thing of art, the book has become. Mm, thank you so much. Um, to be honest, I, I expected it to be more, to have a more explosive um, entrance um, to the market, which it absolutely didn't. And I remember my husband telling me that this book is going to be a slow burn. And I was annoyed because I was like, why? Who wants a slow burn of a book? You want your book to hit the shelves up for everybody to be talking about it. But it has worked out exactly as he said, which means it has just continued to gather fans and readers all over the world. Even now, 11 years after it was published, it, it just amazes me when book clubs, that book clubs still feature it and select it as the book of the month, 11 years after it was published. It's a huge honor and such a, such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. So I'm not complaining at all. 
Um, I think it's a story that resonates with a lot of people. I think it's also a story that people love because this book and, um, you know, deliberately uh, is on the commercial end of fiction, so, of literary fiction. So it's also quite an accessible book. And that's always been my dream, to read books that are accessible and that people can love, read and love. Indeed. And, and Lola, how would you say this book changed your life or even your, the trajectory of your career? In the sense that it, it, I was able to achieve something that I set out to do, absolutely. Um, has it changed it in any other significant way? I guess, I guess it must open certain doors for me. It, it has allowed me to travel. It has put me in a category um, of successful writers, which I very much, which I'm very pleased about because I like to be seen as being successful in the the goals that I um, that I set for myself and, and 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 the aims that I have, so yeah, that's um, that's what I can say. It's it's I'm neither seduced nor impressed by by fame. I don't hanker for it. I don't seek it. I don't revel in it. I don't need it. So um, that aspect of it is is just inconsequential. I will talk about, of course, the famous Ake Festival, but I think you are into other projects that um, are equally of great importance. And one of those projects, I don't know if you still you still have it, is the Right to Read project. Right to Write. It, oh, Right to Write, sorry. Yes. Right to Write project. Um, I, I find that project very interesting because of the places you were targeting and how you wanted to publish these many books and take it to children of different ages to also have the ex experience of, of reading. Be I mean, because I think reading, I mean, in as much as it is a, necess a necessity, it's also, it's a privilege. Like it's, it's a luxury, if you ask me, because mm -hmm. in our part of the world, not many people can afford books. And that's a fact. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, yes. When I read about this project, I, I thought it was such a beautiful thing. Can you tell us more about it? We won the bid from, from the EU over two million euros. But then the because the way the EU operates for a, a project of that magnitude, you have to have um, a, a partner in a European country. And just before we were preparing to start working on the last phase, um, that company we were working with went bankrupt. So we suddenly found ourselves in a, pro in a situation where we started searching for other partners. Um, so that um, project was put on hold until this year. So we're back again in the research phase. And I'm just so delighted that so many um, agencies, so many international agencies who are seeking to help uh, Nigerian children and children in other parts of West Africa are waking up to the fact that these readers, uh, classroom readers, fiction books, picture books, are just as important as textbooks and that one's education, I guess, is incomplete without a child being able to disappear into a picture book and expand their own imagination. I think that's so important. So the, the, the project is taking another form and it's something that I'm very excited about getting into um, this year. So we're gearing up um, for, uh, 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 you know, for a, for a project that focuses on on, on northern Nigerian children, but also ensuring that there's representation in the books, that we're also developing a wonderful crop of, of writers from that part of the country, um, from that part of our country, but also illustrators. 
Um, I'm very interested in the idea of um, creating illustrations as well, which is in itself a very rare talent. It's not the big difference between being an illustrator and being an, an, a, um, an artist. So these are all, um, I'm glad that elements of the project are being revived um, and the hope is that the funding will be there for me to be able to achieve this. When I couldn't continue with the project out of sheer frustration, I decided that I was going to write six books. Um, the theme or, or the name of the series is Northern Lights. And the whole idea was that I was going to write six children's books, all set in um, different states in northern Nigeria, but with characters who are children, who are vibrant, and who are doing um, ch things that children should be able to do. So when it, I couldn't move forward with it as a project, I started doing it within my own personal capacity. And we've just finished the second, um, the second in book in, in the series. Well, I'm happy that you get to go back to work on it this year because I really think it's such an important project and it's so needed. And I, I really wish you all the best. And I hope this time it really takes off. Why do you think books are so expensive, particularly in our part of the world? Well, it's, it's an imported technology. So that's going to come with its um, with its uh, with its costs, but I I also feel that people haven't always been um, been smart about our relationship with paper um, and how to ensure that we have paper mills that actually are alive and thriving. Um, so we're not in a position where we're having to import paper, which is what is happening in a lot of African countries. Some African countries don't even have paper mills. Nigeria used to have three paper mills, and now we have a big fat zero. Um, and the way that we'd be able to combat that is to uh, take all duty off books. So what this means is that if you're trying to import paper into the country, you can pay any you can pay duty that's anything from 5% to 20%, depending on whether you're importing reels or sheets. But if you're importing books, then there's no duty. It's free. So what you find is that sometimes, a lot of the time or most of the time, it's cheaper to buy books that have been produced outside the country than the books that we've produced in Nigeria itself. However, it's a big bugbear of mine, and I have been working with, um, with, with printers in Nigeria for the last eight years um, on principle, Weeda books, books published by the publishing house that I run, are printed in Nigeria. It, it's, it's the only way that we can grow. It's the only way that we can control the cost and keep our prices down. I think you also have this app, One Read app. Yes. I think the last time I, I heard you speak about it, it was just like, you mentioned that it was three months old then. So I'm sure by now it's probably getting to a year. Getting, if not. getting to almost two years now, actually. Ah, um, okay. And that app was introduced, just another one of my um, ideas of, um, I, I'm a bookseller and I kept thinking to myself, well, everybody has a phone, but not everybody can afford Kindle and Audible. What can we do on this African continent to also ensure not only that people are reading and have access to books, but to ensure that they're reading books written by other Africans? I'm one of those people who believes that the reason why wars and Different things, um, I mean, very, uh, the, the, the horrible things can happen sometimes. Uh, conflict has got a lot to do with the lack of understanding of the other. Um, we have a lot of xenophobia in different parts of Africa. Again, it's a lack of understanding. And I remember um, traveling with Zeke's Umda one day um, on the way to the airport from a festival in South Africa. 
And he said to me, look, um, you know, when I was young um, and the Biafra war was going on, the whole of the black South African educated elite was supporting Biafra. And I said, really, why? And I thought that was really interesting. And he said, well, because we, le- we, read, we all read Things Fall Apart. And that simply shows you the impact and the power of our stories and how we get to understand how the other is thinking. We're less inclined and slower to judge and to condemn when we have a decent idea of the culture of the people, the thinking of the people, and there's no better avenue, there's no better route to achieving this than through the books um, authored by people within that culture. So for me, that was what One Read was about, to feature authors from all over Africa, from South Africa to Zimbabwe, to Kenya, to Senegal, to Nigeria, to Ghana. And a dream we have now, which we're developing, is the to have a francophone version. So that again, when you click on the app, you can choose which language you want to read in. And the dream also is to have more and more books in indigenous languages on the app as well as we we grow and move on. Lola, now we can talk about Ake Festival. Like it's taken a whole big life of its own and it's now undisputably the, the biggest literary festival in Africa Congratulations on that. You get that a lot, but again, congratulations. How did this idea come about? Uh, thank you so much. Um, Ake Festival came about simply as me, one, being slightly embarrassed that we didn't have a, a festival of that magnitude in Black Africa. Um, and secondly, because I, the more I moved around talking about my own book, the more I realized the importance and how precious it is for writers to be able to come together. That's what gives birth to other initiatives. So with Kabafest, the first literary festival in northern Nigeria started five, six years ago. Now we have eight different festivals. It's like one in every state in northern Nigeria. We have more in northern Nigeria than we even have in southern Nigeria. And we're supposed, and this is supposed to be the part where you have a higher number of educated individuals. Um, One thing that's really important to me is being able to show people what they can do, what they can do through my own behavior, showing people what's possible. And that's why I'm one of those people, I'm eternally grateful that I'm a woman. Because whatever type of woman that I am, um, I am the type of woman that shows other women what can be done and sometimes what should be done. So I went into it with relative fearlessness, with the attitude of if you build it, they will come. I went with that to the World Bank. We got a nice big grant. We got a grant from Miles Moreland Foundation. Um, And that's how we started, because money is very important in these projects. But one ingredient that was critical to me was excellence. I wasn't just going to have a a festival that some people would say, oh, this happened. And no, I wanted a festival that was world class, that events started on time, that was beautifully, the programming was beautiful. And I brought all my life experience to bear. I was a teacher for many, many years, rose to the position of deputy principal, um, did a lot of work around timetabling. So I knew exactly what was needed. And it was just a situ- uh, it was just a question of bringing together the right team to work with me, because obviously I couldn't do everything. Um, and to delegate and to make sure that they understood and valued um, my position on, pers- uh, on, on our pursuit of excellence. I think I would also probably add that what you're doing with Ake Festival connects to something you mentioned in the beginning of the conversation about when you saw Prince Charles, when you read the book, 
and then you connected it to the author. I think for RK Festival, it's also a chance for a lot of readers to meet authors and engage with them. Would you say that that was also a foundation? Absolutely. I think it's a beautiful thing to, for somebody to produce a work, whether it's arts, whether it's writing, and then for individuals who have consumed it to have access to the creator and to be able to ask them questions. I think there's just something amazing about it. It's why book festivals have been successful you know, outside Africa, you know, Edinburgh Festival, Cheltenham Festival. There's something very attractive about coming in contact with the creator of a work of art and being able to interact with them. And I wanted that for my people. Yeah, it's such a beautiful thing that you are doing, particularly for the younger generation of writers and and readers. Maybe you haven't thought about that in that way, but I feel it's your way of giving back because you mentioned in Ibadan, you know, you go for these monthly meetings with poets and all that who critique your work. They, they kind of poured something into you. And I feel through Ake Festival, you're also pouring into other young artists all over the world. That is a goal. It, the goal is that something will germinate um, with some of these projects and spaces that I create, that if there are people who feel that they want to write, they can come in contact with others who have gone on that journey. And it just makes the possibilities and the potential a lot more achievable. I know you're fearless. You're such a goal getter. And of course, Ake Festival has become this beautiful thing, but it has not been without challenges? Um, so the biggest um, challenge for any festival, especially when you're thinking about how to sustain it, is always financial. The fact that the world generally pretends to value arts and the arts, but, you know, when, it, when push comes to shove, um, you find, especially in these parts, that it's just not priority you know? So I think that's a big uh, part of, 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 that would be, I, I think, one of the biggest problems. Sometimes getting companies, getting government to believe in the goals and to see the value of what you're bringing. Uh, so that's something. Um, and that's a challenge that we keep in the early stages was was huge but uh you then uh i think the bigger you get and the more the better known and the more the reputation is developed better you will find that those institutions the funders will come to you um instead of the other way around so that's really been amazing in terms of uh, other problems i i, I can't really think of any other one because whatever they are I I don't see them as problems and I wouldn't see them as problems because they're surmountable you know Uh, you 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 find a way around it that is life that is life and it applies to everything very very rarely will anything just be smooth sailing so so I don't expect it to be I'm ready for the challenges I love that. And I even forgot you mentioned from the beginning that you don't see obstacles, like you are blind to obstacles. So, some, yes, yeah. um, I feel like that because people tell me when they say, didn't you notice this? I'm like, yes. Yeah, so you you get over it, work, you 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 sort it out, you confront it, you 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 destroy it. Yeah. RK Festival, it's it's big. When you think of going to the next level with this big thing, what do you think about? I'm imagining somebody else younger taking it to those places that perhaps I don't even have any any hope or any uh, ambition of of reaching. I'm not... uh, I've, I've been the director for 10 years and it's very likely that I will bow out after this last, uh, this next one. Wow. 
Wow. I know you're married to a medical doctor mm -hmm. and he's the son of Wole Shoinka. Yep. I wonder how you met. <laughs> yes, uh, we met we met when he came to Nigeria after he'd been on exile. Um, with all the Shoinkas obviously had to escape the political persecution for their activism against um, the successive military governments um, and the atrocities that they were committing. So Ola Okun came and I told his father that his, I liked his son's beetroot lips. That's how I said it. He, he thought it was funny and relayed it to his son. But by then, his son and I had started communicating via email. Um, email was uh, it's a rather romantic story. For six months, we wrote to each other two, three times a day. And it wasn't like now that your email comes to you. In those days, you had to go and collect a dot matrix printout, you know, wow. of the email. So it, it was a uh, it took some dedication. But here we are today. We've been married 23 years. We have uh, between us, we like to say we have uh, between us together, we have seven children. Um, he had children before he met me, um, and I had one also before I met him. And we have another three children of our own. We're a very close knit family. Um, he's an excellent, excellent human being, allows me to have the freedom that we need, um, understands my need for space. So we, we live in the same estate, but we don't live in the same flat because I decided to move out, um, that I, I needed more space of my own and I could no longer. I found it increasingly difficult to share my spaces and, and the kind of incredible man that he is, he understood that. And um, I think we're better friends even now than we've ever been. Um, yeah. 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 Has any of your children caught the art bag or writing bag? Yeah. Your children come from writing royalty. Absolutely. Um, my Both my daughters are writing. My second daughter, especially, uh, sends me a poem nearly every day. Um, mm. She's also written a beautiful children's book in uh, rhyming uh, couplets. Um, my older daughter wants to write a, a, a novel. My son has started and stopped and started and stopped. My first son. It, the only person who's not writing is my younger son. It's just, it's just not his thing. Uh, probably not yet. Well, I don't, anybody can take whatever path that they want. I'm not, I just want people to be happy. Do whatever makes you happy. I'm not asking anybody to be like me or follow my footsteps. My life has not been easy. But um, one thing I know is that if any of my children do want to write, I will definitely be there to give them all the support and encouragement that it, that is uh, available to me. That's great. And Lola, this will be my final question. What do you hope your writing and all the work you do in the art does for women in Nigeria in particular, and then the whole society as well? I hope that it shows what can be done and encourages others to pursue the same and to do things a hundred times better. Thank you so much, Lola. It's Ooh. been a pleasure having you on this podcast. You know, thank you so much for being so gracious with your time. Thanks a lot. Lovely to talk to you. Lola Shanayin is many things, including a poet, author, and publisher. Thank you for listening to Inspiring Open, a podcast series from Wiki Loves Women. This first series of Inspiring Open was funded through the International Relief Fund Organizations in Culture and Education 2021, an initiative of the German Federal Foreign Office, the Gothi Institute and other partners, and an annual grant from the Wikimedia Foundation. If you enjoyed today's show, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Feel free to share, rate, and review us 
We appreciate the support. You can also tag us in your posts. We are at Wiki Loves Women on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll leave you with the words of Ntozake Shange. Sisterhood is important because we are all we have to stand on. We have to stand near and by each other, pray for one another, and share the joys and the difficulties that women face in the world today. If we don't talk about it amongst ourselves, then we are made silent by the patriarchy, and that serves us no purpose. Until next time, look after yourselves and your sisters. And remember, be inspired, be challenged, be bold. I am Betty Kankambwedu, and you've been listening to Wiki Loves Women, Inspiring Open. <laughs>